Hi, I'm Kirby with Augustine E-Bikes. And for the last several months, I've been traveling around the country visiting family and friends. So I haven't published any new videos on our channel in several months. I'm now back and excited to share a whole new series of videos with our YouTube audience. If any of you have tried to buy anything bike or e-bike related in the last year, you've probably found yourself frustrated by a lack of availability and lengthy delivery times. As a result of the coronavirus, the worldwide supply chain has been hit pretty hard. In this video, I'll be looking at the reasons for this and a look at what to expect in the year ahead. Let's start with 2020. The first half of 2020 has been a period like no other for the bike and electric bike business. The coronavirus crisis has brought both challenges and also a boom to the e-bike industry. It's also brought bankruptcies, sinking valuations of a number of manufacturers, long delivery times and servicing issues, and a stranglehold on the supply chain. At the beginning of 2020, manufacturing shutdowns occurred across China and parts of Asia as a result of the pandemic. At a time when Europe and America still thought they were safe, the problems that we were experiencing had already begun. The manufacturers of frames, components, and accessories were slowing down and supply chains were disrupted and interrupted, creating a cease in the production for several months. Now that resulted in a shortfall that couldn't easily be made up for. At the beginning of February 2020, when hardly anybody was talking about lockdowns, we already were experiencing delivery restrictions, fewer choices, and empty bike shops. Some of the current inventory woes began when COVID-based factory closures combined with COVID-based lockdowns that stimulated families worldwide to rediscover cycling. Together, they created a perfect storm, exploding both the interest in bike riding accompanied by an unprecedented shortage of bikes to be ridden. As an example, in August of this year, there were 82,000 bikes, 23,000 e-bikes, and 62,000 traditional bikes on hand. Last year at the same time, there were 597 on hand, 31,000 e-bikes, and 566,000 traditional. That's an 86% year-over-year inventory drop versus 2019, which already had the lowest inventory levels on record. Production is currently around 80% at the beginning of the year. Migrant workers were laid off as a result of the coronavirus. Many traveled home and in part have not yet returned to their old workplaces. When they were needed again, travel restrictions and the difficulty of re-entry, including quarantines and limited availability of hotels, made taking on jobs more difficult. The important role of components. One consequence that already is clear is that bike specs will depend on the availability of individual components, motors, brakes, tires, drivetrains, etc. Delivery times have risen rapidly and in some cases even quintupled. The impact won't just be felt in 2021, but will likely continue into 2022. Shipping challenges have been compounded by more complex transport routes, increased freight costs, and uncertain delivery times. The cost of air freight has multiplied as a result of the significantly reduced volume of passenger flights. In turn, prices have risen by two to three times. Up until now, a large portion of bikes have been shipped via sea freight, but container capacity among shipping companies is lagging too, and the increased demand results in additional challenges. When looking at the supply chain in 2020, one of the things to look at is the impact of tariffs. The second element missing from the bike shortage equation was the expiration of tariff exclusions on many Chinese-made bike categories. In early August, as an example, mountain bikes have been subject to the tariff since last year that now cost more than 25% more to import than they did back in July. Overall, 2021 should be an interesting year for e-bikes. If there's one thing that 2021 has proved to us, e-bikes are here to stay. Long waits for e-bikes, unfortunately, you can expect to wait for a while for a new electric bike in 2021, especially in the first half of the year. Supply chains are slowly starting to catch up. Many e-bike manufacturers are still being quoted lead times of a year or more on components, such as brakes and handlebars. While this is improving in 2021, it will take many months, if not most of the year. So while some companies will be able to maintain some semblance of stock in the warehouses, 
You should still expect many e-bike manufacturers to continue working on a pre-sale or back-ordered basis. This is an update to a video I did a little while back on buying tips for e-bike kits and batteries. My reason for updating this is that the supply chain has been changing rapidly over the last three months. And as an example, New York City is reporting a 300% growth in bike sales due to demand. And the same is happening in the e-bike kit market. Suppliers that I work with are either running low on stock or have forecast for this demand and have doubled their supply. Here are some tips to help you navigate buying e-bike conversion kits. Now for this video, I'm only going to focus on hub motors, and the reason for that is uh, several. Mid-drive kits are more technically challenging. You have to replace your entire drivetrain to install them, so we're just going to focus on the hub kits, which are easy installs, and you don't have to be an advanced mechanic to install them. And also, keep in mind that most of the hub motors are pretty similar. You're not going to see great wide range of what's inside them. You can see my video of what's inside a hub motor. Most of them are made by the same manufacturers in China, with a few exceptions. Uh, and if not completely made, then at least most of the parts are coming from China. And in the case of Bionics or the Copenhagen wheel, just to name a couple of examples, they've designed their own proprietary um, hub and then outsourced that to companies uh, both in Europe and in Asia. I'm choosing a thousand watt as the basic standard for, for this example and the reason is you can buy today anywhere from a 250 watt hub motor all the way up to 8,000 watts and beyond. So there's a huge range in there but for the average person who wants to get that little extra boost out of their bike, convert it and have some energy to go up hills and you know around town, 1,000 watt is a pretty good standard. So as we go through each part of the conversion kit, we're going to go through a checklist, the things that you absolutely want to make sure that the manufacturer has to fit your particular bike and your particular needs. And so as we go through, we'll go through a checklist for the controller, the hub motor, and the battery. So let's start with the motor. We've already decided we want a 1,000 watt motor. So I've typed in a 1,000 watt e-bike conversion kit, and as you can see, a whole bunch of different hub kits have come up, and so I'm going to sort through them using my checklist. Now we already know we want a 1,000 watt. The next thing on my checklist is the wheel size. So for this particular purpose, we're going to use a 26 inch wheel. Now the next most important thing on my checklist is the gearing. It really depends on what, what bike you're using. If you're using an older school bike, it probably has seven gears. But if you have a newer bike, it can range from 8, 9, 10, all the way up to 12 gears. So you really want to make sure there's a match, because otherwise you're going to have to change your chain, uh, your shifter, and possibly your derailleur to fit it. So it's really important that you match the gears to the kit itself. So in this case, I'll be looking for an 8-gear cassette. So now I can see that they have an 8-speed rear hub. Uh, which is perfect. It's a cassette, which means I can actually take it off and, and change the gearing if I want to later on. And then it also is in 26 inches, which is the size of my wheel, which is perfect. Now the next most important thing, and it's really important, is to see the hub dropout size. And that's to see if the uh, hub kit will actually fit on your bike. The standard size for most bikes, without exception, is 135 millimeter in the rear. So here it says 140 millimeter, which is too wide for my bike. So I contacted the uh, manufacturer and found out that they do have this in 135 millimeter. Now, once I've made the selection, I can now see what the price for that kit's going to be. Now, I don't have to make a decision right now because I still have to go through the rest of my checklist to make sure this is exactly the kit that I want. So now what's really important to me is looking at the controller and what, what the kit comes with. I can see here that it comes with a pretty substantial controller uh, based on its length and the gauge of the wires. I can see it comes with a KT LCD 3 display, which I have a lot of experience with. It's a great LCD. And the reason those are important compared to the LEDs is not only the control it gives you over your bike with functions, but also the readout and information about your bike while you're riding. So those, those are both two really important things to me. Now what I want to do is check out the specs on the um, controller, which is really important as well to make sure I've got enough ampage on this. So here I can see it's got a 26 amp output, which is great. I prefer 30, but for the purposes of driving a 1000 watt motor, it's fine. Anything below that would be too little. 
once I've gone through to make sure that all the specs are correct for what I want and my needs for my bike and it's going to fit, it's got the power I want, then what I'll do is I'll actually look at the reviews. Reviews are really helpful because it's, it's coming from users who've actually purchased this product. Amazon, of course, lives and dies by their reviews. But not all sites have them, but many of them do. So that's kind of a one last helpful push to make a buying decision for me. Now it's time to move on to the battery. Now I know that I've got a 48 volt kit, so I want a 48 volt battery. I want it on a down tube, so it's actually on the bike itself. And I want it to have, be, um, have enough amp hours to give me range. Amp hours is what gives you your distance. It's kind of like gallons of gas in a gas tank. So I'm gonna go with a 48 volt, 17 amp hour. Any battery with more than 17 amp hours is either gonna be a rear rack or a triangle. And so in this particular case, I don't want either one of those. So now what I want to look at with the battery is the BMS, or Battery Management System, and see what it's capable of. It's the onboard computer chip that's in the battery, controls output, and uh, works directly with the controller. So I've got a 26 amp controller and a 30 amp BMS on the battery that's perfect. Anything less than 30 BMS I, I probably wouldn't buy. The next thing I'm looking for in the battery is to make sure what cell type it is. So here I can see there are Samsung cells, and given that it's a Halong style battery, these are 18650 batteries, which are the newer, smaller batteries uh, with high capacity. And I can see the watt hours up there and also the cell configuration, which is important. Uh, this is a very standard cell configuration. Uh, sometimes you'll see some really funky ones, and I would just stay away from those. So now comes the hard part. Do I buy these? Price is always a factor for everybody, including me. So I've done my checklist. I've made sure that these products meet my standards of what I'm looking for. I've also worked with these companies before, so I, I have background work with them. And I also do a lot of extensive research on the manufacturers, even though it's selling through Amazon or another third-party seller. But at the end of the day, you have to weigh whether the price meets what you're looking for and how much work you're willing to do or how much more time you're willing to spend. So maybe with enough research, knowing what you're looking for, you might be able to save another $100, but is it worth the 18 hours of research? So the choice is yours, but I hope these tips helped you in your buying decision. Go through your checklist, make sure that these products meet your standards and your riding needs, and enjoy. So here are some bonus tips on how to buy e-bike batteries online. And this is a great way to safeguard and make sure you've got the product you want and get it delivered safely. Sometimes it can seem daunting to sort through all the different choices out there when looking to buy a battery. And since it's an expensive investment, you want to make sure that you're making the right decision. In this video, we'll look at some of the basic tips for buying your e-bike battery that will help you make good and safe choices. One of the first things to understand is that the e-bike battery world, ultimately all roads lead to China. Some of the biggest places to find e-bike batteries are online, such as stores as Amazon or DHgate and AliExpress, which act as middlemen for many manufacturers throughout Asia. Or, of course, you can buy directly from the manufacturer, which I've done many times, but it's a little bit trickier. So let's go through the checklist of what you should look for in order to make an informed decision. First, determine the voltage you'll need for the battery, and that is determined by the voltage of your controller and motor. Is it a 24, 36, 48, 52, or 72 volt kit? The next is to determine how many amp hours you need. And amp hours are important because the larger the number, the greater your range. Next, look at cell types. The biggest makers of battery cells are Sanyo, Samsung, Panasonic, and LG. And sometimes you'll pay a premium for selecting a specific brand versus a generic Chinese battery. In a, in a later video, we'll explore the debate between battery brands. Next, match the right BMS or battery management system. Lower voltage kits can run on a lower amp BMS, such as 20 amp output. But for example, a 1200 watt kit or above will require at least a 30 or 35 amp BMS. I also look at the number of MAs or milliamp hours, which is a unit that measures electric power over time. It is commonly used to measure the energy capacity of a battery. In general, the more MAs, the longer the battery capacity or battery life. Next look at chargers. The 2 amp charger, which is common, 
are the slower charges, while the 3, 4, and 5 amp charges charge faster. And this really is your preference, which kind of charger you'd like to use. Manufacturers always indicate a number of charging cycles. I usually pay no attention to it since all of my batteries have far exceeded those numbers. I believe they list these to cover their ass. I think they're designed to manage expectations of how many cycles you get out of the battery. And then ultimately there's cost. This is where things fluctuate wildly. The tools I use to determine whether it's a good price for the product that has matched all of my criteria are tools such as customer reviews, manufacturer ratings, how long the company's been in business, are batteries their core business, warranties, etc. All of this information is readily available online. I've had great success with aggregators like DHgate and AliExpress with their built-in customer support and customer protection. I hope these tips have been helpful in buying the right e-bike battery that should last you many, many years of great rides.